Welcome to Discovering Nutrition with Chronometer. I'm your host and community marketing manager, Elisa, and today I am thrilled to have on guest Dr. Uma Naidu. Dr. Uma was once described as a triple threat in the food and medicine space. She's a Harvard-trained psychiatrist, professional chef graduating with her culinary school's most coveted award, and a trained nutrition specialist. Her nexus of interests have found their niche in nutritional psychiatry. Dr. Naidu founded and directs the first hospital-based nutritional psychiatry service in the United States. She is the Director of Nutritional and Lifestyle Psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital and Director of Nutritional Psychiatry at MGH Academy while serving on the faculty at Harvard Medical School. She was considered Harvard's mood food expert and has been featured in the Wall Street Journal. Dr. Naidu is also the national best-selling author of This Is Your Brain on Food. In this episode, we sit down with Dr. Uma to discuss the connection between your diet and your mind and what nutrients you should pay attention to to feel your best mentally. As always, this podcast is for general purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including getting medical advice. The use of information from this podcast is at the user's own risk and is not to be substituted for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This is a subject that's near and dear to my heart, something I definitely want to learn a lot more about. Let's dive in. So I'm joined here today with Dr. Uma Naido, and she's written an amazing book that I had the privilege of reading over the weekend. It's called Calm Your Mind with Food. And it's really interesting, the timing of this book for me, because I have tracked my nutrition for over five years, and I've just started to really dabble with honing what I'm eating to not only feel great physically, but mentally. And I didn't really know where to begin. And I actually had about two weeks ago, I had researched what foods I could eat that would help with anxiety because I I was having some some symptoms of anxiety. And then when I found out that you were going to be on the podcast, I read your book. I was like, this is a godsend. This, the timing of this (laughs) book is, is perfect. So I loved reading it. (laughs) I feel like I learned so much. Thank you. One of the things that really surprised me was to learn the percentage of people that actually struggle with anxiety. I think that it was around 35% of the global population. What causes anxiety and why do you think it's so prevalent right now? You know, it's um, thank you for for reading the book and appreciating it. Uh, And I'm hoping that it was really helpful to you as it will be to others. You know, it's not clear what the exact cause of. I think through my lens, I do feel nutrition and how we eat globally does impact the levels of anxiety that we are seeing. The interesting thing is that even pre-pandemic, anxiety has always been the most common disorder, even in the US. Although people think it's depression, it's actually anxiety. I think what happened with COVID, it just became front and center and the levels increased so much. I can certainly speak to the fact that the isolation, the angst of whatever was going on in different phases of COVID, first the lockdown, the social distancing, then the vaccines and all of the data that came out was scary to people. We also saw a spike in uh, suicidal ideation um, as reported by the CDC in mid the middle of 2020. And that was at an all-time high of 11%. So I think that people were just really not feeling good. And with the ongoing worry, which when you think about it, never left us, anxiety levels just kind of spiraled from there. That That's how I've seen it. I noticed in the book that you referenced some of your own history with anxiety. There was uh, a particular incident about getting to meet some of the royal family. Have you struggled with anxiety yourself often or is, or is that an isolated incident or walk me through your own experience with it? Sure, that's that's a great question. I feel like anxiety for me has been on and off. It's never been so overwhelming that I couldn't find 
tools and lifestyle ways to manage it, which is one of the important messages of my book, Calm Your Mind with Food. But the two spikes where I actually identified myself as being anxious the first time was actually when, uh, before my first book was written, and I was undergoing uh, cancer treatment. And for the first time, as I was facing chemotherapy, understanding the types of medications and side effects I was facing, I found myself super anxious. And there, I will tell you, the, the two things that made a difference were mindset shift to let's move this worry into productive action. So what can I do to really safeguard my health through this treatment? How can I lean into better nutrition? How can I drink more of my grandmother's golden chai that will help this healing process? And that was really a very big change, almost leaning further into eating more healthily during that time. And then the second incident, which I reference in the book, which to me were just things that stand out in my life, were a very good thing. And this is the other thing that I wanted to share with people, is that sometimes the anxiety, the stress is over a really positive event. I was accepted a keynote uh, speech uh, lecture at a conference in London, and this was in 2022. And upon accepting it, it was one of the first conferences I returned to in person I was also invited to meet the then His Royal Highness Prince Charles a month prior, unknown to us all, that he would become the king. And although this was such an amazing, you know, I, I kept sort of saying to myself, do they have the right person? I also became really anxious. And I kept thinking, well, I'm, I'm going to trip. I won't know how to curtsy. I've studied ballet, but I still thought I would curtsy and fall on my face. All these funny things that occurred. But, you know, it was a great lesson for me that even something that is amazing could make me feel that way. And how do I use my lifestyle tools, how I'm eating, how I'm living to feel to feel better? So that's those are the two, you know, big episodes in my life that I recall. And why don't we share different things with my audience about how I handled it. Yeah, I think it's amazing when someone kind of identifies a problem in their own life and then then they research and there's not really a solution. I feel like your book is unprecedented in the amount of information it has because when I was searching for what I could eat to alleviate my own symptoms of anxiety, I just didn't feel right. there was a lot of research out there on right. that. And you did mention that there was an uptick in the instance of anxiety from COVID. If I'm correct, this led to a global shortage in medication. Is is that right? The shortage in medication that occurred in the United States is the one I'm most familiar with, was early in the pandemic. There were so many new diagnoses of anxiety that Zoloft, otherwise called sertraline, often used in anxiety, was on shortage and all doctors got multiple emails and phone calls from pharmacies to let you know that they were short. And this happened in the spring of 2020. So an early pandemic, there were multiple new diagnoses. And I have to tell you, I think that just increased and continued to increase. They were able to figure out the medication shortage. But that to me in my career that has spanned just over two decades, I it was shocking. It was it was absolutely shocking. Um, And it really spoke to how people were suffering. I think that if we could create a time machine and publish this book at the beginning of the pandemic, that would be very helpful because a lot of the people that that you talked about in your book that that have been patients of yours, I'm I'm in the same boat. If I don't have to take any pharmaceuticals, I won't. Mm -hmm. And obviously Mm -hmm. that is a piece to manage anxiety. I know there's other ones like CBT, which is cognitive Mm -hmm. behavioral therapy, exercise, meditation, breath work, that kind of thing. But I was so fascinated as someone who tracks their nutrition in nutritional psychiatry. So how does someone determine what is the best way to go about managing their own anxiety? The first step is is understanding or recognizing that you are having this pervasive sense of worry, that you are stressed, perhaps it'll show up as pain, it could be poor sleep, it could be not being able to function because you cannot get your thoughts organized. 
not because of a focus issue, but because you're so, so anxious that you almost can't settle yourself down. And the way where I see the power of calm your mind with food is that there is such a shortage of mental health treaters right now. It's almost as though the number of trained clinicians cannot match the demand we have. So I see this also as an opportunity to use calm your mind with food as a guide to helping you get to that appointment in a few months, trying out something on your own, which is very empowering. Maybe you do want to do CBT, but you can't get an appointment. But starting with these adjustments around lifestyle, simple things like hydration, you know, tracking your food uh, on an even deeper level so that you're targeting foods that may be able to help you a little bit better, even if you are already a healthy eater can be so powerful. And I feel that it provides an almost not only a stepping stone, it could provide that niche for what people need to start on the healing journey around anxiety. And that's my hope, that it's a it's a place that people can start on their own and feel empowered by it too. We know that there's a clear connection between food and physical illness. And right now, as I understand it, 40% of Americans are obese. So we we have identified the connection between food and physical illness, but we don't really understand the connection between food and mental illness. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that with all of the knowledge and studies that we just aren't there yet when it comes to mental Mm -hmm. illness and food? In part, it's it's sort of something that is has multiple factors associated with. Firstly, nutritional psychiatry and the and my clinic in nutritional and metabolic psychiatry at Harvard is a newer. You know, it's only in the past decade that we were able to get this off the ground. And in association with that, there are also doctors are not studying nutrition. There's only a certain percent of our US medical schools that teach nutrition. It's not integrated into mental health care. So one of my missions is really to help other clinicians, practitioners who are seeing individuals with mental health start to add this, these questions to their clinical practice. For many years, we didn't see the connection. Although Hippocrates spoke to this connection between the gut and brain many eons ago, the science had to follow. And the science has really burgeoned even, even since through the pandemic and in the last even three to five years has really helped us understand the deeper science around the gut microbiome as one of the connections between how the gut and brain are connected and therefore food and mood are connected. I'll often say to people, when you have a headache, do you take a pill and rub it on your head or what do you do with that pill? And, you know, we get a glass of water, we take a few sips and we swallow a headache tablet. And I will then try to interpret to them, well, you're swallowing it. And what happens to it? How does it get to affect your brain, where usually the headache is originating from? And, you know, it starts the conversation around how food gets digested. There's this food mood connection, but there's also gut brain connection as one of the examples. But, you know, it gets more complicated. The immune system is involved. Inflammation is involved. And it has to be expanded as the science advances too. I know that there's a lot of research out there now about the gut brain access and I read a lot of books and I was honestly surprised to know that they were so interconnected although in hindsight in my own life that tends to make sense. One of the things I thought was interesting in this situation here is we're not really sure which one comes first, you know, like the chicken or the egg is do we have physical symptoms in our stomach of gastric upset because Mm -hmm. of anxiety from our brain, Mm -hmm. or is it the other way around, you know? Can you explain what the gut-brain axis actually is and why these Mm -hmm. findings are so important for mental health? Sure. So one of the mechanisms that we understand brings nutritional psychiatry to life from the scientific realm is that the gut and brain originate from the exact same cells in the human embryo. They then divide apart up in the body and form two separate organs that are pretty far apart, but they remain connected by the 10th cranial nerve, which is the vagus nerve, which allows for an anatomical connection. Uh, physically be connecting these organs, but then also allows for this two-way messaging system between the brain and gut and the gut and brain, allowing for the neurochemicals to actually be communicating between these two organ systems. But it doesn't actually end there. Not only are these organs connected, 
but 90 to 95% of serotonin and serotonin receptors are in the gut. Many people call serotonin the happiness hormone. And it turns out that if someone is prescribed a medication like Zoloft that we mentioned earlier, they initially have a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms as the side effects. And this is also because of the location of the neurotransmitters. So food is very powerful because the digestive products of food interact with the precursors to the neurotransmitters and actually may help the formation of certain neurotransmitters in a positive way. And it really does, it shows up clinically how food can be impactful in lowering anxiety, helping mood, and so many other conditions. I think that one of the one of the biggest takeaways for me, I, I guess reading your book did give me some hope and knowledge on what I should be paying attention to. A lot of the time, I know I have a sensitivity and I've spoken about it before on our podcast here to garlic and it just Mm -hmm. basically like blows up my gut. And then, so I've started actually tracking within chronometer Mm -hmm. the consumption of foods with garlic Garlic, with an anxiety level. So I've actually created a metric called anxiety and I've I put it on wow. a scale of one to 10 and I've started to track it against the food that I'm eating to see what foods particularly can trigger for Cause me. Of, yeah. yeah. So I'm in the early That's stages it. of that, which is why I yeah. loved reading your book so much because I was like, now I also have, you know, macros to pay attention to and you right. listed some micros, which I thought were were so cool. So I'm on the precipice of this right now, but I have noticed out of the gate yeah. that when yeah. I do con- consume foods with a little bit of garlic, because like. everything has garlic, True. then anxiety is higher. So I was like, wow. this is this is super I'm s- interesting. I'm really fascinated by that. I love that you shared that. And thank you. Because garlic is part of the Allium family. It's a great prebiotic source of fiber mm-hmm. for many people, including myself. But, you know, I, I say this all the time. There are these nutritional psychiatry nuances. Not every healthy food is healthy for every single person. And part of that speaks to the uniqueness of the gut microbiome as well. You know, it's really as unique as a thumbprint. So you and I will respond differently to the same food. But I'm so glad that you made that association. How did you first, if you don't mind me asking, how did you first like catch on to that? It was garlic. Yeah, great question. So I did use chronometer as well to track that. Similarly to anxiety, what I was doing was I created um, a custom biometric for like basically upset stomach. So the symptoms that I see are honestly like excessive bloating. I would look like nine yeah. months pregnant after yeah. consuming yeah. things. And the one thing that caused the most upheaval for me uh, was garlic bread, which is really too bad because it's so delicious. (laughs) And then from there, I I was like, okay, this is like a food that really, I'm a 10 out of 10 for dysbiosis. So, So then I need to see if smaller doses affect. And it will actually, for me, if I have garlic bread, for example, which I don't anymore, but if I did, it would be weeks I would be uncomfortable wow. for. Wow. And now reading your book and reading other books, like I've read another book called Fiber Fueled, which delves a lot into gut health. I was like, mm-hmm. that makes sense. And I don't know this because I'm obviously not a physician, but I am kind of like a little bit biohacky. <laughs> I wonder if I've upset my gut microbiome by, mm. <laughs> by having garlic. If I just go in there with a wrecking ball and then it has to fix itself. So I'm familiar with the term, obviously, you are, you wrote about it extensively, but for those who have no idea what we're talking about, could you just elaborate on what gut microbiome actually is and yes. and why we need to keep a diverse amount in our intestines? Is it our intestines? Uh, so intestines, yes, exactly. Yeah, so we made the connection and understand that the gut and brain are connected. But when you talk just about the gut, the microbiome is the trillions of microbes that reside in large part, it's the large intestine, but in our gut. And when we say microbiome, it includes their genetic material. 
If we just say microbes, we're referring to these trillions of usually bacteria, viruses, ar archaea, protozoa, fungi, but usually it's the bacteria that we, we do the most amount of research on. And that's why we tend to think about it that way, but there are other types of microbes there as well. The trillions of microbes are there to really help support our health. And really, our job is to help nurture them so they can function. They can fend off the dysbiosis. If, say, someone has this discomfort when they eat garlic, they can fend off whatever the you know food is that which which may actually not be agreeing with our gut. So unhealthy foods, et cetera. We'll get to that in a second. So the trillions of microbes will say help with digestion, but then interact with the plant polyphenols that we eat. Why is it important for there to be diversity? Because the more times that we introducing new bacteria, allowing for diversity through color, flavor, texture of food, different types of vegetables, counting the colors, counting the different greens that you eat, counting the different plant-based foods that you're entering into your body, important because they actually contain fiber. Those foods contain fiber and they help to really nurture the gut microbes. Um, and that's why they become important. It is hugely key to understand that the gut microbiome can also engage in things like helping our immunity, um, sleep and circadian rhythm, circadian rhythm, rhythm being our internal body clock, um, helping with our mental health conditions, fighting off uh, infections through immunity, and so much more vitamin production as well. So it's important for us to understand that this gut microbiome actually is almost like a little factory doing these activities and it has to be healthy to do so. So, you know, we want to eat healthy to help keep it nurtured. One of the questions I have, and it just was sparked by something you just said, I know that having antibiotics can wreak some havoc on our gut microbiome. Yeah. From what I understand, and it can take weeks uh, to, to get it back to, Longer, to yeah. where it was. I'm curious does Zoloft and and do anxiety medications have a similar effect? Will they will they hurt our gut microbiome? And if they do, that seems a little counterproductive from from what mm -hmm. we're learning about the gut brain axis. Right. I don't know that we the science is there yet to say that the antidepressants actually disrupt the gut microbiome. Unlike a food substance like artificial sweeteners, where research has been done to show that they can be, in fact, disruptive to the gut microbiome. What I will say is that they are interacting with those receptors. The receptors are interacting with the microbes. And the healthier our gut, the better that that medication can be absorbed and take effect. So I think that it's hard. You mentioned earlier how, you know, we don't know about the chicken and the egg. I think it's similar with, say, treating anxiety with Zoloft. We don't know if the primary issues with whatever the person is feeling in their gut, in their stomach, is came first, or whether the anxiety call, you know, came first, and, and and sort of teasing that apart becomes really important. What I can say is, if you are eating a healthier diet and trying to change out the habits that are making you have dysbiosis or an imbalance in your gut then you are helping the healing and you are helping along that medication. That makes sense. Why do you believe that something like nutritional psychiatry over prescribing medicine would be the best place to start when attempting to solve mental health disorders? Firstly, because we all eat, we eat several times a day and we don't realize that we have the power at the end of our fork. And these decisions, the choices we make about what we eat can actually impact our mental well-being. Most people think about it as the number on the scale, the waist circumference size, gaining weight. And not all of those things are important, but it's not the only thing. Our brain is also affected. And, you know, mental health can no longer be seen as just an above the neck phenomenon. It's our whole body. So by how we eat, how, how stressed we are, how difficult work maybe at a certain time frame. All of these affect our stress levels and our anxiety, and they also affect our gut microbiome. So they become hugely important in finding ways to address them better. And I think that if people realized how powerful food can be, they can each make a change right now. That could help. I completely agree. And obviously with Chronometer, we have 
the most comprehensive information within our app in terms of macros and micronutrients. A lot of the words that you were using in your book, you know, relating back to micros and and macros mm-hmm. were really familiar to me. And I was actually very proud right. of the work that we were doing here because you are talking about how diets can really alleviate a lot of these symptoms. And for me, mm-hmm. it was so fascinating. And maybe other chronometer users will experience this as well. But you actually, it was so helpful that you listed out the different micronutrients that could play a role. And then I was like, where is my intake with these? So I right. actually used your book as a checklist. That's great. To, yeah, it was so, it was so interesting. And I wonder if we could, we could add it to some of the things in the app that people are sort of looking for, you know, because it's sometimes so easy to have a checklist because then you know, you know, where am I getting this nutrient? Where am I getting that nutrient kind of thing? You know what's so interesting? I was just talking to our project manager, uh, Brendan, before I got on this call with you. And we have these things in the app. They're for our gold subscribers, which is the premium version, but they're actually Mm -hmm. their nutrition scores. And basically Mm -hmm. what it is, is it just takes a bunch of different information on nutrients, puts it into like one convenient score. There's like bone health, Mm -hmm. women's health, that kind of thing. So people that, that are looking for something in particular, it's just, it's just way more, no pun intended, uh, digestible for them. And I said to Brendan, (laughs) after reading your book, I'm like, we should work with Dr. Uma to create an anxiety nutrition score. And he was like, do you think the information is out there yet? I'm like, I honestly... Honestly, after reading this, I think that there is enough knowledge now that we could do this. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that Love it would that. be so helpful. So I'm definitely going to get, get on the, the rest of the team about this because uh, for, that's fantastic. Yeah. for me, I'm not someone that really wants to take any kind of medication. If it's possible yeah. for me to yeah. get what I need through food or through my diet, that's way more preferable because I think a lot of the time with medication, I understand that some people do absolutely need it and it's required as part of their, their wellness. But for me, I just, I would rather look first to a holistic option. So reading your book, I think that's why it was so good for me. And I really hope that our listeners read it as well, because there's so much to learn here that puts things that are way easier. Like all of this is available in our grocery store. You don't need a prescription yes. or a doctor's appointment. Yes. You just basically go and and go to the produce aisle and stock up. And then you did make other recommendations for diet, which I really want to delve into a little bit deeper. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's macronutrients that can support anxiety. And then there's micros. Obviously we mm-hmm. need we need mac everyone needs all three macronutrients uh the micronutrients that's that's a little bit harder for people to really understand unless they are tracking their nutrition if they're getting but mm-hmm. what would you recommend is the ideal mixture of we'll start with macronutrients can you can you speak to those first please sure so with the with the macronutrients we want to be certain that we are covering the basic food groups. And I think where we in this country tend to go wrong with these foods is that we are eating too much processed, uh, ultra processed foods. So we are not eating whole foods. And for that reason, since our diets are largely processed, ultra processed, often fast foods, I'm not saying everyone is eating this way, we are thrown off from what we should have been eating. If you think about what your grandparents or your great-grandparents were eating, they were not really thinking about going to fast food restaurants or eating the way that we do. So macronutrients are your basic fats that you need to eat from healthy sources, your carbohydrates, which you can get from healthy sources and whole foods, and your proteins. As I explained this, I also like to share t- with people that your plant foods and your veg- your vegetables and your fruit are what give you fiber and fiber fuels those gut microbes. And that's why it's so important to understand that in your macronutrients, the reason that you are uh, including those that food group is because you want to also be eating enough fiber. So creating the right balance of those foods becomes important. So for example, let's just look at fats. You want your fats to come from healthy sources like 
avocado, olive oil, omega-3 fatty acids from fatty fish, or the plant-based algae and seaweed and uh, chia seeds and flax seeds. So that becomes an important way to obtaining your, your sources of fat that will also help support your brain. What about micronutrients? So for those people that aren't familiar with the term, obviously macronutrients are protein, fat, and carbs, and the micronutrients are vitamins and minerals. And there is a lot that we actually have to pay attention to in general for overall health. There's a lot of RDA recommendations. For anxiety specifically, Can you give us a quick laundry list for what would help alleviate anxiety from a nutritional psychiatry standpoint? Yes. You know, I want people to think about micronutrients, think about the vitamins that you may be deficient in or that you've been concerned about. You know, could you be low in vitamin D because you live in the far Northeast like I do and individuals are exposed to less sunlight throughout the year. So some of them could be vitamin D deficient, in which case you want to to have your doctor check that for you. Perhaps you are a plant-based eater and you don't consume any form of animal-based protein. So you actually might be deficient in things like iron levels as all vitamin B12, because you tend to get those largely from animal sources. So that becomes important. Then there's vitamin C. Vitamin C actually helps iron absorption. So if you're low in vitamin C, you could also be low in iron because they work in a connected way. So these are just just some of the ones we touch on. But then, you know, you go deeper into things like magnesium. Many, it turns out that many Americans simply don't have enough magnesium in their system. And magnesium is so important for anxiety. You want to be thinking about these as you as you consume your foods. And it's just one way to get us started. Is the only way to identify if you're deficient in something through a blood test? Or do you think that someone like me could look on their data from tracking and be able to identify shortages? So I think that's a really good question. I think that the data could indicate to you that you are short on something. But what the test does, a blood test does, is it allows you to test and not guess. Once you have tested, say, a a shortage of vitamin B12 or a shortage of vitamin B1, whichever it is, you can then figure out the right supplement or the additional foods that you could eat to help yourself. So I think the data is important, but when we want to get more specific about the intervention, then you just need to know, are you low in iron? Because you may actually require iron supplementation as well as eating more iron uh, nutrient-dense foods. So your preference would always be to get these nutrients from foods as opposed to supplementation? I'm actually very open to supplementation, especially as I've realized none of us are perfect eaters. And there are times that we just need to supplement something outside of how healthy we are trying to eat. And this is where it becomes important to add in that vitamin D supplement if you need it, to add in vitamin B12 if you're vegetarian or plant-based could be super important. Always best to check so that you are not getting into this blind, but helpful to to supplement when needed. A great example of this is there's, you know, a spice called saffron. And saffron has a significant amount of evidence for improving mood and thereby helping anxiety because depression and anxiety tend to run together. And in the studies that were done, they use supplemental saffron because firstly, you cook with very little saffron and it's hugely expensive. So the supplement form had a much higher dose of saffron. That's a great example of something that can help mood with a good amount of uh, testing and evidence behind it, but that you wouldn't necessarily find useful to have from a food source. It's just simply not enough. You also had a client, if I'm not mistaken, that started supplementing lavender, I thought was interesting. I didn't know that you could consume lavender up until this weekend when I read your book. Yeah. That's right. As as a supplement. Correct. And it's been out there. And sometimes, you know, with a patient who is otherwise healthy and something that they can try, it becomes an additional tool in their toolkit for fending off anxiety. There were a couple other things that I thought were interesting 
on a personal level, as well as I'm sure a lot of people go through the same things, one of which was caffeine and the other was alcohol consumption. So Mm -hmm. I'm a big black tea drinker and you definitely Mm -hmm. highlighted that 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 is helpful. Although, (laughs) caveat, I do put probably too much sugar in my tea. So maybe, maybe I am not, maybe I am like basically neutral when it comes to tea versus <laughs> sugar. Uh, not really doing myself a favor, but caffeine consumption and anxiety. I think that one of the things you said was less than 400 milligrams. Is that what we should be? Yes. Doing? So some, some research has shown that if you do tolerate caffeine, so there are people who have even a decaf and feel jittery and feel uncomfortable and then it's really not for them. But if you can consume ca- caffeine, then limiting the amount, um, having it early in the day, less than 400 milligrams, which is approximately one to three cups, could be a little bit more depending on the strength of the caffeine, the type of coffee, consuming it early in the day so it doesn't impact your sleep. And then the other uh, the other guidance I give people, people is cleaning up your coffee, you know, because I think if you're adding a ton of processed creamers and stuff, it's not the healthiest, but you know, this will benefit from the coffee itself because coffee has a lot of plant polyphenols. A lot of good research has been done on the positive benefits of coffee. So, you know, finding a healthy tweak as you go along may be helpful, uh, may be helpful for you. And the other one was alcohol. So this is one that I'm tracking myself. Um, I tend to not drink alcohol. I just simply don't love the taste Mm -hmm. of it. And Mm -hmm. if I don't love it, why do I need it? But right. there was actually some conflicting research. So some mm-hmm. research studies said that it causes more anxiety. And some mm-hmm. said that it can actually make people less anxious. Yes. So as with all, especially in, in nutrition research, you know, there's always some confusion about the epidemiology, the studies themselves, how do we collect the data? Is this based just on food frequency questionnaires? How are these things being tested? I think the take-home point about this is that for those who choose to consume alcohol, because I'm certainly not going to advocate go out and start drinking because, oh, a study said something. But if you don't consume alcohol, continue as you are. Make sure you're hydrating well with things like water. You're good to go. But if you do consume alcohol, I think the guidances are not that dissimilar to how I speak about coffee or caffeine, and drink in moderation. If you don't feel well, this, this may not be for you. You may need to make an adjustment. Maybe it's too much for your body. When you, when you consume alcohol, have clean cocktails, no point in adding multiple different concoctions to a single drink. Also, additional sources of sugar like simple syrup and other liqueurs, fruit juices are just added into the mix and make them very calorie dense, but high in sugar as well. So drink in moderation if you do drink. If you're developing an issue, a concern, or problem, seek help. Hydrate well throughout uh, throughout your day anyway. And try to cut back if you feel like some of that is getting is getting out of control for you and then seek help. Awesome advice. Obviously, everyone needs to read your book and they will learn in greater detail what the six pillars to a calm mind is. But before we leave for the day, can you give me just a general overview about what those six pillars to a calm mind would be, Dr. Uma? Thank you for asking. So, you know, I feel like it's easy for people to remember things that are in uh, sound bites is the word I'm looking for, because sound bites just help people remember things. One of the pillars is eat whole to be whole. And like I spoke about earlier, you know, we just are tending not to eat actual food. So eating whole foods and actual foods become important. The calming kaleidoscope plate is another one. I love the colors and textures of different vegetables and fruit. Remembering that is bringing biodiversity to my gut microbiome and to my body and brain is important. So adding in those colors from all types of food are huge, including and emphasizing those micronutrients, which we touched on, prioritizing the healthy fats. So, you know, we want fats from omega-3s. We want them from olive oil, avocado oil. Uh, We want to be getting those in. And then, you know, avoid anxiety triggering foods because no point in spending time 
on all six pillars, but you're actually eating a ton of foods that are just driving your anxiety. And, you know, lastly, just finding some consistency and balance with your overall sort of plan that you are undertaking. Um, because that way you are putting, you're almost putting it together. That's what the book is about. It's about understanding the background science, giving you grocery lists, giving you a protocol, but then also saying, here's how you put this together for yourself. Included in the book are a plethora of amazing sounding recipes, some of which I'm going to have to try because you are a chef. <laughs> they all sounded very <laughs> fancy, but doable. I can't wait to try some of Thank them. You. The question I always leave off with is if you had one thing that you could tell people that you believe would change their life, what one piece of advice would you give our listeners? I would say to them that the power to improve your mental health also lies at the end of your fork. So the decisions you make and how you eat can truly impact how you feel while you are getting any other type of help that you may need as well. Amazing. I encourage everyone to read this book. For me, it was perfect timing, but it sounds like with 35% of people struggling with mental health issues that this book could not come at a better time. I think that there's so much to be learned. I hope that we can work together on some kind of nutrition score going forward, Dr. Emma, that. because I think that it would be really, really impactful. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here and we'll provide all of the, the links uh, so people can find your book, Calm Your Mind with Food, and where they can find you on socials as well. We'll drop those in the show notes. Wonderful. It was lovely to talk to you. Thank you for the Thanks. questions. Have I'm so glad the book was helpful. <laughs> awesome. Have a great day. Thank you. As always, I make sure that I do my homework when it comes to the guests we have on this podcast, but I will say that Calm Your Mind with Food was one of the best books that I read in 2023. As someone who has been curious about how my diet affects my own mental health, this book was so illuminating. I hope that you love this podcast and I hope that you pick up the awesome book, Calm Your Mind with Food by Dr. Uma Naidu. If you like this podcast, make sure you subscribe, or if you know someone who would benefit from hearing this episode, please pass it on. Until next time, have a great day.